1826. They came here from the Shenandoah Valley, Virginia, around 1808 uh, with two children in a covered wagon. And that covered wagon is still in existence today. It can be seen at the Historical Society. Um, they worked for a couple brothers until they made enough money to buy some land. And around 1826, when they had 12 children, they built this wonderful federal style home with Virginia accents. Now the house is back to its original condition and it's one of the oldest homes in Clark County. And it's certainly uh, a historical treasure. David died around 1839 and his wife continued to live here until she passed away in 1836. But there was actually, the boys, several of them did not marry and they continued to live here. And then uh, family members actually occupied the home until the early part of the 1900s. Parlor. And um, this is a room that would not be used very often. Um, it would be used for special occasions such as wakes or weddings. Um, but this room would have all the formal furniture. Um, it would just be a, a room that would seldom be used. Sorry about that. I think my auto uh, slide must be turned on. A room that would seldom be used. Um, it's furthest away from the kitchen, so it's probably the coldest, even though we do have a fireplace. But, but this is definitely the, uh, the fancy sitting area that would not be um, used very often by the family. Um, this is actually the dining area, but it was much more than that. It was a common area. Um, this is where the family stayed the most. Um, they would eat here, they would cook, and so small things here. Um, the kitchen is right behind us um, in, a, in a, a separate building, but um, this was the warmest place in the house and it saw the most activity. So um, this was not for formal occasions, um, but this was where daily activities took place. So spinning, weaving, playing, um, eating, uh, this was uh, the family um, center of the house. In 1966, the Army Corps of Engineers came into this area. They purchased the land and um, they were going to bulldoze this house. But um, some of the, um, the, the higher up members of the Army Corps um, saw this building and, and realized that this was a really great intact structure that showed um, early life in, in Ohio. So um, they actually um, wanted to save this house. So we have a spillway that's um, over there and they had actually moved the spillway, the location of it, to save this house. So um, even in the 60s, it was, it was an important structure to the people that, that came into this area. They recognized the history and the importance of this house. Right, we've got herbs here that would be um, dried over um, this fireplace and also the kitchen fireplace. There's an arm here, so um, this arm can swing back and forth. Um, that would be used for cooking, um, for doing small, small things in here, for heating up water. And it's just um, an easy way to get the, the hot water out of the area without burning yourself. So, and if you notice on this deck of cards, they are not numbered. So if you were playing a card game, you have to be pretty adept at counting your, your cards. Um, but, so we have a, a period deck of cards here and it just kind of one of the early board games that, that would have been played. So, you know, board games are uh, a family tradition that goes back centuries. Okay, so um, this area is the kitchen and this is the hub of family activity. Most of the things that uh, would have been done in this household would have been done in the kitchen. So obviously the cooking is the biggest thing and this is, um, you can tell the difference between this fireplace and the one in the parlor. This one is bigger. This one has the huge arm here to swing back and forth for all the cooking. Um, this is also the warmest place of the house. So this would have been, um, of course, the area where the family would, would crowd in. So um, the cooking, the, the dyeing of fibers, um, the drying of herbs, um, a, a lot of these domestic activities would have taken place in this kitchen. Um, this specific type of kitchen is called a Virginia federal style kitchen. And um, the reason why this house has this separate kitchen, um, the man David Crable who, who built the house was from the Shenandoah Valley in Virginia. And this was very common to separate your kitchen from the rest of the house because if this kitchen area burnt down, 
the rest of the house wouldn't suffer from it. And it was just very common that it would be actually completely detached from the rest of the house. So um, that would be why this kitchen is kind of on the outer side of the house and not in an integrated part. And I think a large part of that is because this fire would be going 24-7. It would be going um, the entire day and the entire evening. So um, it's, it's a dangerous um, area. So if it did burn down, you wouldn't risk the rest of the house. This type of activity um, requires, you know, a lot of love and dedication, and it wouldn't be um, in the position it is right now without volunteer support. And I actually got involved in this for a love of history and a love of heritage. And it's it's something that I think uh, local communi communities can really take part in it and, and really, um, you know, feel a sense of pride in in the local um, treasures that we do have in this area. And so I think that volunteering for organizations like this, for nonprofits, um, really uh, gives back to the community, and it and it really supports uh, a really important part of our our heritage and our uh, our neighborhoods. We want to make sure there's nothing in the barrel, so he'll search the piece. Finding nothing, sponge. Sometimes there's a tiny little piece that won't be picked up by that searching piece, and that sponge may pick up a tiny little piece, so that's what we're clearing a barrel. Advance, salute. Now he's put the charge, a pre-made charge, into a bag and he carried it up. Load! He's making sure the charge is round and will fit in the barrel. Ram home, charge! Pick and prime! Now she puts the metal piece in that hole slams it shut and puts a hole in the charge that we just shoved down the barrel. Make ready! Fire! Well, that's a that's a great little video about the about the house. I like that. I was um, I don't know if there's any Canon crew members out there, but I think that they have um, you have to register. But I think they have training in April out there if you want to join the Canon crew out at George Rogers Clark Park. They train people uh, how to do that all safely. Uh, this is a great another great picture that somebody shared um, online the other day on on the program. Um, I don't know if anyone knows John Herlock or. Um, where he got this photo, but this is a wonderful photo um, after, and this is George Burkhoff sitting over here uh, on the, this is on the, uh, the back end of the house. There's the, the 
the shed uh, that's out there. He's sitting back behind this. So I'd never seen this picture before and I hadn't seen this angle of the house before. So um, this was a really great find. Um, I need to message it. He just put it, uh, posted it the other day on, on in a comment. Um, so I have to ask him where he got this one. But this is a great shot and a good way to, to go into the uh, restoration story of the house because George Burkhofer, who was the uh, with the Clark County Historical Society in the 70s um, had spearheaded uh, that effort to do the restoration. And he, he's here with a, a, a big crew of um, volunteers out there uh, working on the house then. And this is, um, they had determined that the later porch that was put onto the house was much wider. Um, it's about, about maybe four times the width of the current porch that's on the house. They determined that that was added much later than the original home would have been. It didn't fit with the original style of the house. So um, that was one of the early pieces that they removed to take it back to the smaller porch that it is today. So this was when they were in the process of um, removing that. Um, and when you look at the house today, you can, can't even see the footprint of where, where that other one was. It had, you know, the bricks um, had, had changed color. Um, and this is one of the, um, you know, well, one of the earliest homes, it's the earliest public, publicly accessible home, um, and the oldest publicly accessible home still, um, still standing in Clark County. Um, but it was, um, you know, unique in that it was a brick home, so they would have had to have been making those bricks um, near the site, um, some of, well, uh, or, or tracked them onto the site. So this, that, that was a, um, a really unique home to, to be there to, um, and we, I know we, the, the docents talk about it. It's in the, in the 1820s. We um, land around 1826. I know that the tax records uh, point towards that as far as the um, date of the house. Here's another view from 1973 uh, that you can see that they have completely removed that and how you know different the, the brickwork um, coloring is between both of that. And you can see um, before they started work on the uh, the kitchen area there in the porch over there, you can see how, um, how it kind of looks rough in the picture. It's not a very clear photo, but we've got some um, more photos later that show you a little bit of what um, what that had looked like. Um, we've got the crew out there um, working on that. This is George with his back to the camera here. Uh, they're, they're working on the, the, the railing part of the porch. They can see someone up on the roof. And uh, this is they, this must be much further into the restoration of the porch portion because there's some some worse photos that you'll see in a little bit. Here we see George working. Uh, I'll, I'll, this is that that's the kitchen porch here, um, coming into the the dining area, and you can see uh, the the mantle that's in the in the. Uh, the dining room area. And um, I'm, I don't have the full tour that I know that the docents give. I know that there's a couple of people on here that have worked as docents or that are going to be um, out of the house in the near future um, as docents. But um, they tell more fully the story of the house. And um, But I do know that the, the main thing um, that when the uh, reservoir was being built, there was, there was some homes that were moved wholesale and there was homes that were removed. Um, and there was a, a house that was just about the same period in style of the Crable house uh, that they were able to take some, a lot of the interior woodwork and pieces and the mantle and everything and transfer them to this house because uh, the problem with the Crable homestead is that after uh, people started, stopped living in it regularly, it sat abandoned for quite a while. And um, as things are when they sit abandoned, it was heavily looted. Um, every, a lot of the interior pieces were removed. So when they did start the restoration project in the 70s with the Historical Society, a lot of those pieces were gone. So it was um, very unique and wonderful opportunity that they were able to take those pieces from this other house that was um, the same um, that matched it, that they could replace a lot of those um, elements in the house. This is a, a detail of the dining room fireplace that you saw. Um, that was Katie Nowak that had uh, managed the house before in that earlier video, um, standing at the, uh, the fireplace in the uh, dining room area. So you can see this was 
uh, what they were working with before the restoration. Uh, this is the, the porch and the, this is going into the kitchen area. This is going back to the dining room. And this is a really, a really good shot of the porch to show um, just the, the, the look at the, the roof, what, um, you know, all the work they had to do on the roof and, and everything to shore that back up uh, and make it a fully restored piece. This is the back side of uh, the house with all the windows and doors boarded up. And this is from the coming around the side of the house. So this is the front that faces the, the reservoir. And then this is some of the interior um, plaster work showing some of the cut in cut details to, to some of the, the walls there. And this is showing, I'm not, not sure exactly what section of the house we're looking at here of the interior. I think this is a fireplace back here. There were, there's three fireplaces in the house. There's one on um, the uh, dining room side, there's one in the kitchen, and then there's also one in the front, uh, the front room to the, the uh, left when you walk into the house. So if there's anybody on here that can figure out exactly which angle we're looking at, there's some steps here. I'm very confused by this one. <laughs> This was just in with all the, it was, it was the best one that showed an interior photo though, but I'm a little bit confused as to what section of the house we're looking at. Almost looks like it's upstairs because there is a staircase that then goes up to the attic. That's uh, kind of I wall. agree. That's upstairs. Oh, it is. Okay. Cause this is, so this is that front. So when you go up this, this is the stairwell. I see yeah. this little section here is the stairwell. This is that first front, that front bedroom that has the fireplace. That's the fireplace. And then there's some uh, little set of stairs. This is the little doorway that takes you up to the creepy attic, which yeah. I've been to. I wish I had some more interior pictures to show you that, um, but we do have some interior photos in a, in a little bit. But, and then there's a little room here, which I know there's been some discussion as to the use of that bedroom, but we know that the, the Crables did have a large amount of children. So we can't imagine that they didn't use this little tiny room as a bedroom as well. Uh, I know that it, over, over the years, it's been, you know, talked about in the tour is that, you know, a storage or whatever, but we've talked about it. Yeah, they had a lot of kids. They probably would have been using this room for kids as well. Uh, so for, it's a small little room right when you come up the stairs, which I've got a little video later. If I can get it slowed down enough, we can stop and see the different parts of the house. This is a great picture here that shows down from um, from the water, looking back towards the house. And this is, you know, before the for the full restoration, because you can see the porch is off. Um, but again, I'm really uh, if anyone knows more about the development of the reservoir and the land around it, this grade of the hill is so much smaller than it seems like it is today. If you're standing at the, ho the house looking down, it's a pretty steep hill um, down to the water. And this doesn't seem that way. It might just be perspective, I'm not sure. Uh, but it's a pretty neat photo, nonetheless. This is a great one showing, showing it uh, after the restoration. You can still see the discoloring from um, the previous porch. Um, and I don't know if that's something that has just worn off over time or worn down or if, if uh, additional work was done on the brickwork to make it uh, match what it, what it looks like now. Um, but I know I, when I was there last time, I was comparing it, trying to see if I could see the original line and it's not as stark as this, this contrast that you can see here. Uh, here's a great uh, drawing by Mike Major. Uh, if you're familiar with him and his work, he has lots of great um, sketch work and drawings and, and a whole book of, of uh, local history buildings and things like that. And then all of the statues um, around uh, Springfield of like uh, George Rogers Clark and uh, O.S. Kelly and uh, Harry Toolman are all by Mike Major. So this is a, a great uh, drawing of the home.
Now this is, um, so I, I, this is another thing that popped up in the scans of things that I was going through when I searched for the word Crable. Um, this is further improvements that were done on the house in the late 80s, uh, 1989, um, through funding from the Luis Crable um, Trust Fund. Um, so I wanted to share some of this because it's got some great pictures of the house um, uh, and, and a good view of the reservoir from the front. This is, says it's from the front door in October, um, just 50 paces from the front door of the homestead. Uh, and this is a view taken from the shore. And again, I feel like this seems like not, it, I, I can't imagine the grade would have changed that much, but it seems not as steep as it looks when you're, when you're out there today. Uh, so this is, try and move it forward. There we go. Um, let me make sure I didn't jump ahead. I think I might've jumped ahead. My mouse is being finicky right now. I will, what is, all right, we'll just, we'll just stay on this one. I'm not sure what it. Uh, someone asked, would the dis discoloration be whitewashing? So yeah, it may have been uh, whitewashed and that has since been taken off or, or power washed off. Um, I'm not sure um, if anyone knows uh, any detail about that. Um, so this is showing the upstairs. Um, they call that the girl's bedroom it has a trundle bed. Oh, okay. So I, my mouse is jumping on me. Try and get back to the bedroom. There we go. So this is the girl's bedroom. Uh, there's there's two beds in there now. We're actually working on getting another bed um, in the house. Um, sometime this month, we're going to be picking it up. Um, but there's there's a quilting frame up there in, in one corner of the room. Um, this is the downstairs. Um, Alternately called the parlor. Uh, I know now we're leaning more towards that. That was also probably a bedroom maybe uh, um, used by the parents. Again, a lot of children in that family. They wouldn't have used space for a parlor to greet people when they, they needed pl places for people to be able to sleep. Uh, so I know that's, that's kind of a thing that may have changed as far as the interpretation of, of how the house was used over the years. Um, this is a picture from back then showing a museum docent describing period clothes. Um, um, many questions about children's games, clothing, household chores, and meals are answered before a walk to the garden, smokehouse, and barn. The docent employs first Christian posture, pretending to be a Crable close relative or neighbor, as she tells stories of candle making, spinning flax, holiday trips, and helping parents. Now this is this is a, a, a something that's not out there um, anymore. Uh, so this says volunteers have kept this uh, herb, herb garden thriving for a decade. Flower beds, a patch of flax, sorghum, popcorn, and other crops are grown near the house for educational purposes, sponsored by the historical society. So this may well be something that comes back um, with with a with a right you know work and volunteers that, that might be something that can be out there again. Uh, this has uh, 50 old fashioned, old fashioned plants and herbs are sold each spring at the homestead, which I know the plant sale was always something that uh, George Rogers Clark Heritage Association has had out at um, George Rogers Clark. I can't recall if they had done it out at the homestead as well. If there's anybody on the call that knows that, um, let, let us know. I saw that they're having their, um, their flower sale is going to be um, out at the George Rogers Clark in May um, this year. Um, but it says many share their experiences in drying and using the harvest with inexperienced gardeners. And then over on this side, we've got pictures of a barn that's no longer there. Uh, it says the barn is the first building seen by the visitor. A threshing floor occupies the center of the structure. Vintage equipment and salvaged logs from early 19th century cabins fill the other spaces. A woodshed and sorghum cooking vat are located near the barn. Uh, children enjoy hay rides around the farm at the annual Halloween party. So you can see how the programming and, and different things out at the, the, ho the homes that have changed over the years, both all three of these structures are no longer uh, out there. Um, and I myself am not sure of the details of when they were removed, but I think Roger may be able to answer. I think the barn may have come down sometime in, um, when we owned it previously. 
um, before George Rogers Clark took it over. But I've got, um, once we get past these slides, I've got a few more pictures that show the barn, a better view of the barn. Um, these are some photos of the, some of the restoration work that was done in 1989 with the help from that funding, um, showing that there was a bulge in the exterior wall, exterior wall by the back door that was eliminated by pouring a footer below the surface and relaying 20 square foot of brick wall that had three courses thick. Uh, it says that the Historical Society installed vintage spouting, replaced rusty chimney flashing, installed a few hand split and shaved shingles, and buried a four inch drain system around the foundation to prevent water, a major threat to preservation from endangering the total structure. They also replaced the kitchen porch floorboards with treated material very similar to the original. This says, uh, Michael Wright, an inexperienced histor an experienced, sorry, an experienced historical renovator was employed by the society to carry out repairs. He easily duplicated the original mortar, plaster, and floor, floor joists by using on-site materials in the same manner. This is a hand adds replacement made of white oak from the previously felled and cured tree. Renovators installed a treated timber below ends of the floor joists to prevent sagging floors if future rotting were to occur. Tapered blocks leveled the beams to compensate for 160 years, 163 years of compression, deterioration, and vibration from dancing children. A few replacement boards were salvaged from a home of the same period in the next county. And this says one of the three steel ties installed behind plaster and chair rails to stabilize the verticality of the walls. So this must be in the dining room area, I believe. Oh, did I go backwards on it? Okay. And a few more. This is a view of the kitchen, um, separated by a three course brick wall. Both kitchen and dining rooms have doors onto the sm a small side porch. This reflects the builder's Virginian heritage and provided his family safety from fire and a cooler summer home. A root cellar is located below the kitchen. So if you go around outside the porch, there's a, a root cellar underneath, um, like a, a basement area. It says, this says 600 people enjoy hot mold cider simmering in a huge copper cauldron hung on the original crane each Halloween. And visiting school children are fascinated by the collection of utensils for food preparation and preservation. This says a period coverlet fails to hide the lumps in a corn husk mattress on the rope strung bed. The wardrobe is a Crable family piece, which I don't believe is still in the house. I don't think that wardrobe is there, um, but I could be wrong. I just couldn't, couldn't picture it today. And I didn't see it offhand in the pictures that I have. Um, this says photo three shows Crable House from the Southwest. One of two large parking lots serves, serving visitors is located here. Says, hundreds of sugar maples and many bright oaks provide full uh, autumnal splendor to the area. And if you've been out there more recently, you know that uh, as far as uh, trees go, the tree, trees everywhere have, have suffered over the last many years so that the, the landscape out there tree wise is a bit different. Um, but I'm the, I know that something that they've struggled with over the years is, is the ability to get large amounts of people up there at a time because the, the, the road up to the house is very winding and uh, not really usable for large buses or anything like that. So um, this tells me that when it, that the, the whole structure of getting up to the, the, the house must have been a lot different in the early years after the restoration. So again, if anyone knows more details about those or remembers those early years in the 70s and 80s out there, and can give more detail. We'd love to know that. Here's another one showing an electrical conduit being installed um, for dehumidifiers in the spring uh, as the cold walls become damp from condensation. Humidity must be reduced to preserve family pieces dating to the Civil War era. All electrical connections are hidden in cupboards. Uh, Mrs. Mr. Wright also fitted a hand adds replacement section into the floor joist by the back door. Additional rot and insect damage is visible on the door jam. And on this side there, this is the corner of the dining room. They removed the flooring to gain access to the interior wall between the dining room and the center hall. Massive concrete footer was poured after lifting the wall to provide substance and structural 
to prevent uh, st structural weakness. Floor joist was repaired by replacing the end of the rotting beam. This shows that rotted beam removed. So we're still doing work on the house uh, today. Uh, so at, at this time as well, uh, there's been uh, work on the chimneys and uh, there'll be work on the windows and, and other things. Uh, this is another view of that barn. And I believe this is of the barn being built. So um, it, I'm not sure what that meant. It, it didn't stand for very long because <laughs> I know it's not there now, uh, but it appears to have been built in the 70s as far, part of that whole project. This is a picture showing the Crable family reunion out at the, the homestead in front of the house. This is from 1994. And I don't, I don't believe any, I don't see any of the Crables, any Crable names popped up on here, but I know that so, there's some of you that's not your last name anymore. So if you guys know anything about Crable family reunions or have been to any out there, we'd love to hear about that. Um, that's something I'd love to have more information on. Lisa asked if the barn was a replication for, replica for education purposes. And I'm thinking it seems like yes, for storage and to store large pieces out there. Vicki Dean says, I'm told that she was at a family reunion as a child in the early eighties, but it was too young to remember it. Well, this looks like a, a fun reunion out there. And this is very much how the house looks, looks today, except I think the bushes might be different. I can't, we've got, we've got a later picture. Um, wanted to tell a little bit about some of the specific family members that we have a little bit on in our archives. Um, this up here, this gentleman who I think looks a lot like Christopher Reeve um, is Pearl P Preston Crable. Uh, he, his grandfather was Thomas Boss Crable who was one of the uh, sons of Barbara and David Crable. Uh, so Thomas, from what I understand, the Crables were good friends with the Voss family. Um, I think in the tour, they tell a little bit more about the connection between them. Um, so that tells me that Thomas, his middle name was named after, was, was after that, that um, family connection there. Uh, but Thomas Voss Crable was one of the largest landowners in the area. Um, Pearl's father, John, down here, John Crable, um, was an influential farmer in Springfield Township where Pearl was raised on the family farm on Crable Road near Pitchin. Uh, Pearl attended local schools and graduated from Wittenberg, and then received a mechanical engineering degree from The Ohio State University. After graduating, he joined the Foos Gas Engine Company, um, later married Bertha Jones. Uh, when the Central Brass Fixture Works was organized in 1907, during the early days of the automobile, um, he got involved. At that time, cars didn't have bumpers or hubcaps, and Pearl Crable designed the first commercially used bumper, which became the company's specialty. Specialty. Later in 1907, the company reorganized as the Central Brass Fixture Company. Uh, Crable remained a stockholder with Foos Gas Engine during that time, and then it later reorganized into Mass Foos Manufacturing. Central Brass Fixture was sold in 1926, and Pearl retired and was active in the community as director, treasurer, and chairman of Buckeye Incubator, director of the First National Bank, which he um, held until his death. This is him in 1943, about uh, 10 years until his death. Uh, he died in 1953. Um, and at the time of his death, he was living at 818 North Fountain, uh, which his wife Bertha gave to Wittenberg. Uh, so uh, that's where our connection is. The Historical Society came in because uh, we leased the building uh, and had used that as our site in the 80s after, uh, the, after Memorial Hall closed and we had to move out of there. We were um, operating out of 818 North Fountain. So that's where we had our research library and a lot of our, our um, collections items. Um, and if you've been to the Heritage Center, uh, the first floor uh, rental space that's available for meetings and where we have a lot of our meetings and activities and things like that is in the Crable Discovery Hall. So it's named after the Crable family. And above the windows there, we've got a picture of the wagon and the house. And this is a um, picture of Pearl Crable with um, Jim Turner and Fred Miller out at Snyder Park, um, testing out a self-starter on a car. Um, which, if my memory serves me, that was invented by um, Charles F. Kettering uh, of Dayton. 
So, and Lisa says, yes, Charles F. Kettering, definitely. I worked at the Kettering Foundation, so pretty sure of that fact that he invented the self-starter. So this car here is a, has a self-starter on it, uh, which is much safer than the hand crank and get out of the way. So those are, that's, that's some of the, we have more um, Crable family genealogy um, information and stuff in the archives. And there's some Crable books um, in the research library in our family history um, book section. Um, so if people wanted to, to find out more uh, specific information about any of the Crable lines, um, but there's not a whole lot of like information in there as to like, you know, where they lived and all that too. So we would love to talk to anybody that has memories of that because every once in a while I'll, I'll run across people that say, oh yeah, I remember going out to the house or, you know, um, they have some story connected to it. So if we could piece some of those stories together, that would be uh, really help us understand it better. This is a uh, uh, Army Corps of Engineers uh, blueprint showing you um, the layout of the house. Uh, you can see uh, this would be entering from that front porch area until you go into a hallway. And then the dining room is to your right. The parlor area is to your left. And you can see there's fireplaces in each fireplace here, fireplace in the kitchen, fireplace in the parlor. And then you go up the stairs to the second floor. On this map, they call it nursery and sewing room to that little room in the middle. And then you've got a hallway here that takes you into a, two rather large bedrooms. This one has a fireplace. Uh, and then this is the portico or porch um, that leads into the kitchen area. So pretty good representation of how the house is laid out, if you haven't. Um, and then this, I, I'll, um, I'll warn you, um, when we went out there last March um, with our, uh, some of our, our Wittenberg student interns, um, one of them, River, had done a time-lapse video, unbeknownst to us, he was doing it the whole time we were there. Um, but if you've ever done a time-lapse video, it, it uh, compresses it all into a very short, fast video. So I will play that for you first, and then we'll kind of slow it down a little bit so that you can see um, a little bit of detail of the layout of the house and the rooms. So here's a quick one. Um, if you get motion sickness, you may want to look away. Uh, Very, very quick run through of the house, but let me, let's see. I believe if I, oh, I don't know if I can do it on here. I can kind of jump a little bit. I'll do that so we can, on my computer, it showed that I could jump a few seconds ahead at a time, but it looks like I just have to do it manually. Um, one of my favorite pieces here though, is this little, um, uh, floor cloth, kind of like early linoleum painted um, uh, floor cloth that, that is um, in the entryway there. Um, so you go into the uh, hallway and then this is the kitchen to your right. And then this is when we were opening up the house and, and, and Start, they were starting to clean for the season. Uh, heading back through the hallway toward the back of the house. And there's a little parking area down near the house. And then up the hill, there's a, a larger parking area for visitors. And then this is going into that front room, which was either a parlor gathering area or another a, possibly uh, used as a bedroom. We've got Mary Humphreys, one of our um, Historical Society and Crable House longtime volunteers. We head up the stairs. And then this is where you see that little room at the top. which has some uh, chairs and other tools in there right now. I think they're reworking the, um, how that room is staged. But 
And then, oh, oh no. This is the, uh, the they call it the girl's room on the, on the left at the top of the stairs. And I'm not sure um, if Casey or anybody knows where we're planning to put that other uh, bed that we're working on getting, if it'll be in the middle room or uh, the other room. I'm not sure what the plans are for that one, but I guess we'll see. Uh, I love the rag rug on the uh, large one on the floor in there. And then this is the little door that goes up to the attic. And there's a little closet there. Another kind of closet storage area over here. And then back down the stairs. And out to the reservoir. And there's a brick oven out there that I know is used by some of the visiting um, reenactment groups that come out there. So that's a little a little virtual tour. Um, and Lisa asked um, if I the exact amount of children. And I cannot recall off the top of my head. Um, I meant to look up Mary's notes. Uh, I know Ski, I don't know if Ski's still on this call. I know he was out there um, the other day for a little bit of um, training because he's one of our uh, Heritage Center docents and I know he was going to um, help out at the Crable Homestead. I'm not sure if Mary um, got, told you that fact, but I Mary, remember. Yeah, Mary said there's 12 children. 12 children. It started out with two, and while they were there, they had 10 more. 10 more. Basically, I knew basically, she said the mom was pregnant the whole time they were there. Which is why I am certain they were definitely using those rooms as bedrooms. <laughs> they had that many kids uh, in such a short period of time. Uh, and um, I think it was... Uh, there were seven girls and five boys, maybe. I think it was more girls than boys. Or it might have been the other way around. I can't, I can't recall the amount um, of each. Um, then we got some pictures of, of events out at the, out at the homestead. Um, I'm not sure the time on this one, but this is um, the former uh, director of the um, Clark County Historical Society, Floyd Barman, out there for a um, caroling. These are some, we've got a blacksmith out there, which I know that's something that they're working on getting up, having a blacksmith out there for one of the events this year. This is a 1977 fall harvest festi festival out there. Some of the pictures from that. Uh, this is, I, lo I love that the kids getting to use the, um, this, the cider press out there, which would be neat if we could do something like that out there again. Um, these are more recent, showing some uh, uh, people out there working. I, the, uh, the Mike and, um, and Fritz working on hand sewing and um, Dan Harenko uh, doing some woodworking out there. Uh, this is a, a picture from last fall when they were, they were out there cooking. Um, here's Becky, who's the, managing the house right now. Uh, Becky Bostick, she's... Uh, tending the fire and was, I think, cooking on some uh, apples and onions out there. Uh, some pictures from the 80s. Um, one of our longtime volunteers, Ann Benston, was very active out there. Um, had several pictures of her that I, we, I ran across the other day. I was excited to see her. Uh, and here's a picture from of the home of 1982. And here's some more recent pictures of, uh, of there's there's um, often different reenactment groups that will go out there and spend the weekend. Um, it's a great site to be able to you know cook and um, be, dress in period clothing and have fun. And this was a group that was out there last year and they got some great pictures out at the house. Um, this is uh, last year we had a pumpkin contest and uh, uh, the winner was uh, Lisa Ricky, who's on this call, because she did this awesome painting of the, the Crable Homestead with cutouts in it. Uh, we, we actually tried to completely carve ours, and it 
collapsed. It did not come out well. <laughs> she had a much better idea to paint hers, uh, and I thought it turned out great. Uh, so that was uh, that was really neat. That, she, uh, that was our, our winning pumpkin. Um, Vicki Vicky said she had to run, but she's going to motivate and dig back and see how her family line goes back to David Crable. So we'd like to hear more about that, Vicki. Um, we got to, uh, I got to go out there um, a couple weeks ago with uh, Sydney, our graphic design and, and media person here at the Historical Society. And we spent the day with uh, Becky and uh, Lisa Harinko uh, doing some cooking. And we had uh, Mary Humphreys was out there and um, new volunteer, Randy and uh, uh, Pat Tipton and her husband, Bruce were all out there. And we, we spent a day um, filming them cooking and we got to eat it, which was a very delicious and tasty day. So they did um, ham and beans and potatoes and um, uh, baked a couple of apple pies that were delicious. Uh, so that was a lot of a lot of fun to get to see how they do that. And that's something that I hope that I can learn to do is um, some hearth cooking. That's something I've always wanted to do. Um, working on getting my own uh, costuming for out there. But for now, if there's anybody who's interested in volunteering and you don't want to um, jump right into um, costuming, we're, we'll, we'll have uh, uh, t-shirts available for volunteers that want to be out there but not, not get fully into it. Um, and we got to make, uh, this is one of the, the videos that we did of how to make an apple pie. Uh, so I'll, I'll play this for you guys. I can attest that the pie was delicious. Everything was delicious. <laughs> I know. I know. Lisa has a lot of a lot of experience with hearth cooking, and so it always comes out great. So it was so really good. Um, uh, Sydney, our graphic design and media person, she worked on a new logo for the um, for the homestead that captures some some more of the detail and and stuff. So this is what we'll have on the the new T-shirts out there. And. Uh, these are some of the programming from last year. Um, so we'll be working on new graphics and stuff to advertise the things that are out there this year. So last year that we had an old fashioned fourth. This year we're going to have Christmas in July. Excuse me, Christmas in July and July. Um, there'll be some more cooking going on out there and, and uh, different uh, demonstrations of colonial crafts and, and arts and, and things like that. And I think the Lafferty, um, the sisters from Lafferty Pike will be out there playing again. So um, <clears throat> April 29th, there's going to be, um, it's the Clark County Service Day all across the county. All, um, people can help different um, nonprofits and organizations by doing service throughout the day. Um, so I know that we've got lined up to have people out there to help uh, clear the lane and do some trimming and, and, and get the, the site all ready for, for the season. Um, so they'll be out there with the crew on April 29th for that. And let's see what time is it. I've got this one. This is the video we actually made last year to help promote the first open house. So you'll have to excuse uh, the couple of details that have changed. And it's now managed by the Clark County Historical Society. And uh, the dates are one day off this year. They're April 9th and 10th and not the other dates. Uh, but otherwise, and it's from one to five. Otherwise, the details are the same. So I thought we'd go ahead and share this one. A short little if video. you've visited the Heritage Center Museum, then you probably remember the covered wagon that greets you when you first step into the National Road Gallery. This wagon brought David and Barbara Crable and their family to Springfield in the early 1800s as some of the earliest settlers in this area. 
Did you know that their original family home, built in the early 1800s, still stands today above the Clarence J. Brown Reservoir? Painstakingly restored in the 1970s by the Clark County Historical Society under curator and executive director George Burkhofer, the homestead is now operated by the George Rogers Clark Heritage Association, the same group that presents the annual fair at New Boston. Throughout the year, the house is open to visitors to explore what life was like for these early settlers. The first free open house of the season is this coming weekend. On Friday, April 10th and Saturday, April 11th, from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m., visitors can tour the homestead during the School of the Soldier. This will give people a chance to see members of Captain John Linegal's War of 1812 Militia Company from Champaign County, the same company that David Crable himself served with as a first sergeant. We hope you can make it out there this weekend to step back in time. So here's the details for this weekend. You will get to see John, uh, Captain John Linegal's um, from the War of 1812. Uh, they'll be doing uh, School of the Soldier. They'll be encamped out there all weekend. So anybody that visits will get to ask them questions about uh, life as a soldier or how they're, what they're doing, what they're cooking, what they're, what they're doing out there that week, uh, this coming weekend. So they'll be there from uh, 1 to 5 p.m. on uh, Saturday and Sunday, uh, the 9th and 10th. So we hope you guys can go out there. Um, Tours are free, but donations are appreciated. Um, and I think that this is the uh, entire season. So School of the Soldiers in April uh, and May will be celebrating officially the Homestead Homecoming um, of, of the Historical Society taking back over uh, the Crable Homestead. So you'll get to meet some of our uh, board members, uh, volunteers and staff. And we'll have a little bit of an exhibit set up out there um, that people can look at. Um, in June, we'll be looking at what the life was like in the Victorian home. July will be Christmas in July. Um, in August, we'll have um, historic interpretation of uh, with Native Americans uh, as talking about the, the um, relationship among the Shawn with the Shawnee um, and white settlers. Um, in September, we'll have a little bit of baseball um, on through at least part of the weekend, we'll probably have some other um, 18 slightly later area activities happening. Um, there, there will be some Reapers and other vintage baseball players out there uh, demonstrating the game of baseball in the early years, what it was like. And then October, we'll have um, harvest days with um, dances and uh, different harvest activities, crafts, and demonstrations. So that's the season. Um, from April through October. So we invite everybody to come out, uh, see what it's like and see what life was like back then and to get involved if you're interested. Um, could always use more volunteers, uh, people that wanna do um, historic first person interpretation. You can learn how to do that and get involved and share that with people that you know that might wanna be involved in that way um, to keep it going. Cause this is something that's been going for a very long time and we're happy to um, be a part of it again to, to continue the traditions out there. I want to thank you guys for joining us tonight. If you have any questions, if you have any stories, if you know anybody who's connected to the house that can give us more stories, please pass them along to us. Um, if you're interested in volunteering, um, all those things, you can um, call or email. Um, we have an email set up, crable at heritagecenter.us, so you can give us any of that information. We'd be happy to have it. So, um, you guys have any questions or anything? Um, I thank you all for, for coming out tonight. Yes, Natalie, I have one question. This is Ski. Um, early manual in the Heritage Center about the Conestoga wagon indicated that it was made in the early 1830s. And obviously that's not the case. So when was that wagon built? Well, Ski. I don't think I realized that our docent manual says the 1830s. Maybe I'm so, wrong, but I, I thought so that was. This was you, you, you may be right. And our saying that they brought it, the family here in that is probably just not something that I should say then. <laughs> I may just have, have those facts uh, a bit before the horse there. I should, you know, if no, that I may agree. have 
that may have been a wagon that they used later then and we just mm -hmm. have it i just have it conflated in my own mind so i'll have to do a little bit more i uh, very research. well could be wrong i very yeah. well could be wrong but you know what i think i think we probably do say that it's later and we but we do know that it's a family wagon and i do uh, i've uh, recently i've run across the articles about how the wagon got passed down pearl crable had it for a while at one point it was actually given to um i believe to the dar um and somehow came back to came to the historical society i don't quite know the facts about that but we do have the owner chain of ownership is that it came from the crables um but i could be wrong with the dates it could just be a lot later and they didn't come here in it but it was something that they they later had <laughs> Anybody else? And um, yeah, like I said, if you're interested in volunteering, you can come out. If you come out during one of the open houses, you can talk to anybody out there. Uh, Mary Humphreys and Pat uh, will be out there doing tours this weekend for sure. Um, and I know that they they love to talk to anybody and, and get them more information about getting involved um, for the long term. So we'd be happy to have you. Thank you guys for coming tonight. Our next program virtually is going to be um, on April 20th. We'll have a special guest, Dr. Nara Vetla. I don't know if you guys are familiar with him, but he's a um, world-renowned heart surgeon. Uh, and he has a uh, book that he's written called Salt Kills. And his daughter is also a world-renowned daughter. And she's a doctor and she is working on a cookbook uh, of healthy recipes. Um, uh, and he will be talking a bit about how we can be healthier, which after our last virtual program last week, which was all about cooking, um, probably the most unhealthy things possible. We are cooking a lot of recipes from our archives. And I know at least the ones that I cooked were full of salt and very not healthy for me. So uh, I think that uh, he's speaking as part of uh, Minority Health Awareness Month and just in general uh, to help, you know, we thought he would be a good special guest to talk to people about uh, how to be healthier. So that'll be uh, next uh, on the 20th at seven will be our next virtual program. So thank you guys for joining us tonight. Um, I hope you learned a little bit about the house and the family. And um, if you run across anybody that knows more, send them our way. We'd love to keep gathering information. So thank you guys so much. Have a good night.